do not do this unless you're already strong because you're wasting your time. But if you're already strong and you decided that you want to keep getting stronger, but you also want to start chiseling the the shape a bit more, then this is where this stuff comes in. Ladies and gentlemen, Will Morris. Will is a free man. He's just left the military and he's joined Starting Strength Gym. So we are fired up to have him with us. We've been uh, courting him from some times and playing a little hard to get. His contract with the government has uh, superseded our, our ambitions, but uh, that's all behind us now. So here we are. Welcome, Will. Um, yeah, I'm glad to be here, man. Yeah, yeah. Guys, if you've heard Will on the podcast before, you know that uh, this one's going to be filled with a whole bunch of gems, uh, useful things that you can apply directly in your training. Will is my coach. He um, has helped me overcome my knucklehead tendencies. So I'm actually able to train productively and not just consistently hurt myself. I'm one of these idiots who's a coach that needs somebody else to program for me because uh, if, if I'm programming for you, I can I can manage the load correctly. If I'm programming for me, I just go, I just I, my brain stops working and I go balls on the wall. So um, thank you, Will. Uh, Will, there's a bunch of stuff I want to talk to you about. I want to lay it out for the audience so they can uh, know that we'll front load it with the good stuff. And then for those that are interested in the details of the company's inner workings and our announcements and things, you can stick around towards the end. But what we will start okay. with is. Uh, I think that the calendar invite I sent you for this one, Will, was how to get swole, bruh. So, um, <laughs> yes, that is, that is correct. <laughs> so, so we will uh, we'll talk about getting swole, <clears throat> um, and then I want if we have time, we will talk about Will's career change and what he'll be doing for us at the gyms, and then whatever else we have time for. So, Will, let's get straight to it, man. Uh, okay, I'm a dude. I'm an average gym goer. I really want to look good. I want to be big and muscular. What do I do? (laughs) This, this always causes uh, consternation with people because you know, this is probably one of the most common questions that I get because whenever people come into the program or they come to me for rehab coaching or whatever, it's always, almost always going to devolve into, well, now I feel better. My shoulder feels better, whatever. Now, now I want to start looking good. Um, and so it's always a, it's always a difficult conversation to have because I think, um, a lot of individuals see, see it as almost like a fork in the road, right? Like I can either get strong or I can be aesthetic and I can be muscular, but I can't be both of them. And there's certainly, certainly some evidence out there that might support that hypothesis because you see plenty of strength coaches that look absolutely terrible. You know, they may, they may be strong, but they don't look good. And then a lot of people will see that. They'll see somebody put up big numbers and they'll say, well, I don't want to look like that. And if being strong is going to make me look like that, then I just want to train for physique or aesthetics. And at this point, you know, guys like Chris Bumstead is probably known by virtually everybody. And he's kind of like the the pristine example of what everybody that's a teenager to about 30 years old wants to look like. And so people want to look like that after they've gotten after they've gotten rehabbed or they get a little little strong, then they then they do that because I think most of the time, probably 95% of people who get started lifting weights in the gyms are kind of a closet bodybuilder. You know, like they may get into it because they want to get stronger, but in in a certain period of time, they're going to want to trail off into training more for physique or aesthetics, or at least make that a bigger part of their training. Especially for for men under 40. Yes. So, um, and, and we you can't knock it, right? Yeah. I mean, there's there's oh, I want to look of, good, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, and you can't you can't fault people for wanting to look good. You yeah. can't fault people for wanting for not wanting to look bad. Um, and I think we kind of turned it into a little bit of a a running joke that you know training for aesthetics is worthless. But maybe the way that a lot of people train for aesthetics, we could argue that it's it's worthless there because the 
time commitment that they're going to get out of training that way is probably going to lead them down a road to where they actually get to, they get nowhere. Yep. But there are better ways that you can that you can train for that. I think it's kind of funny that you you invited me on here to talk about this because for a long time, like I've said, I'm the smallest starting strength coach by far. Like, but but you're <laughs> you're simply just talking about like body weight. You're not talking about uh, proportions and and actual aesthetics because. The first time I saw you, I thought you were on gear and you were a bodybuilder. And then, and then part of the reason why I wanted to have this conversation is because uh, you cannot judge a book by its cover. Um, you weren't on gear and you weren't a bodybuilder. And when you and I were having a discussion, you were telling me because you you programmed some uh, some body part split stuff for me, and we'll talk about why that is. I know that's heresy, yeah. guys. Stay tuned, and we'll discuss why. Um, but you, you told me just the other day in preparation for this conversation that it's like, man, if you want to get, uh, and, and this is general advice and you weren't speaking to me, you're, you're talking in general, if you want big arms and a big chest, get your bench to 315, you know, yep. and, and this, 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 this falls in line with the message we've been trying to send lately, which is strength training is adding lots of lean muscular body mass quickly. You are literally building your body. Strength training is bodybuilding. Um, once you are strong, your muscles will, will be able to produce enough force to where if you applied stress at a body part level, you'd have a hypertrophy effect on those specific body, body parts. So you would, uh, you, you, you bake the cake with strength training and you shape and decorate the cake with, with the individual body part split stuff. But if you skip the baking the cake part, you're just masturbating. Um, that's, that's my simple view of the situation. What's, what's your take? Yeah. So I use a, I use a slightly different, um, like illustration. So, um, a lot of times, even people coming into the clinic, they're working through some type of injury or something like that. And they're getting to the point where they finished rehab They're They're wanting to enter back into normal training. And so we, we always have the discussion about what their fitness goals are so that I can kind of try to leave most of my, my patients in the clinic leaving them with some type of well-programmed strength and conditioning program so that they don't end up at being a referral right back to my service. Right. And, you know, probably the vast majority of people, nine out of 10, at least start talking about that. They, they want to look better. Um, and I mean, that, that falls in line with our, our demographics and the population, right? Uh, two thirds of two thirds of Americans are classified as obese or overweight. Um, and so it's a, it's a disproportionate amount of people that have a, primary training goal of looking, looking better, right? So I asked the question and I just illustrate it this way. If I were to commission you to carve a statue for me, would it be more efficient for you to take a block of marble and just take a big sledgehammer and just kind of knock away big pieces to where you get the general shape that you want. And then you have like this, this graded level of chisels from very big to very, very small. And then the finishing thing being water and sandpaper, right? Or would you rather take little pieces of clay and perfectly shape and mold them, move on to the next one and perfectly and shape them and mold them and build that up to, to make the statue. And invariably, even though I'm not a sculptor, I know somebody in the comments is going to be like, <laughs> No, that's, that's we'll, we'll, not find, actually, we'll find an expert sculptor in the comments. His name yeah, will probably be he, Ludix Gunder, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and somebody like, well, actually, that's not how you carve a statue. But just, just with Go me, with us right? here, guys. This is a metaphor. So, and then everybody says, well, yeah, it'd make more sense to just kind of use a sledgehammer and get the shape that you want. I'm like, all right, in this parallel, the barbell movements are going to be your sledgehammer. You're going to use that to build the foundation of mass that you need to then be able to use big exercises moving down to smaller exercises as you start trying to shape the body to what you actually want it to be. What most people do is they work the bottom up approach. Yep. Yeah, you've got a guy that's six foot three and 130 pounds and he looks like Big Bird and he <laughs> starts with creature curls or concentration curls because he's identified a need that he wants his arms to be bigger, but he's using the smallest possible movement to try to grow muscular size and that's going to take you years and years and years to see any appreciable difference because you have to have a foundation of strength yep. the foundation of strength makes the isolated movements so much more efficient whenever you're looking at it as a time commitment because the isolated movements don't cause the same amount of structural strain as the bigger movements as you built a good foundation of strength 
you can move towards smaller muscle groups or muscle movements themselves. And now because you're generally strong, you're moving a lot more weight and creating a lot more muscular strain, which is what's going to lend itself towards the hypertrophy effect. Yep. And you know, that's where virtually everybody goes wrong. And you see people train for years and years and years with no appreciable change in their in their body type or their physique because they start with the cool, complex, isolated movements thinking that that's going to build the, fa the the physique that they want when in reality you start with a physique that's bigger than you want and you trim it down. When I, when I opened my first gym, it was because th this observation reinforced the fact that I had to do it. So I was training at 24 hour fitness in Irvine, California. I'd go there, I'd wait for a rack. And that was my first annoyance. It's like, all right, we, we, I just need to build a gym that has more racks. This is bullshit. I've got things to do. Right. Um, there's a bunch of other issues with training there, but the, the second one was I would be there three days a week. Sometimes my days would change. And I remember one guy in particular was there every time I was there, regardless of the day. So he's, that tells me he's probably on a six day a week bodybuilding split. I saw him there over the course of 18 to 24 months. He was lean. He was skinny. He had small muscles, but they were well-defined and nothing changed about him in two years. And I'm thinking about all the PRs I set and all the muscle I added over that same period of time. I, I, I look different in that same amount of time. And uh, looks aren't, aren't the main goal, but I just found it quite ironic that he was doing exactly the same things I was doing 10 years prior, and culture hasn't changed to update people's understanding. And I'm like, this poor guy, if he, if he just realized that the barbell is the answer to his question. Um, the other thing I wanted to comment, Will, was <clears throat> actually a couple things. So first of all, you mentioned that um, you advise your patients, because for those that don't know Will, Will's a doctor of physical therapy. You advise your patients that once you leave the clinic, they need to go do some things to stay strong so they can stay out of your clinic. So that's yes. that's that that reinforces uh, Will as a clinician. He's telling you that the strength is is the thing that keeps you healthy and and capable. So that's that's a point I wanted to reiterate. That's that's critically important. The other thing is when you were talking about the sculpture metaphor, what occurred to me is that the way you should build strength and size is from the inside out and not the outside in. And by inside versus outside, I'm referring to your center of mass, let's call it. So like your, your hips. Um, everything in terms of building strength, compound movements, moving heavy weights, all starts around the hips and then moves itself outward. The, the hips are the most robust joint in the body. They're surrounded by the most amount of muscle mass. That's the, the centerpiece of our training, so to speak. Um, and bodybuilding body part split kind of goes from the the outside in so you're starting with your with your appendages with the smaller muscle groups with the small joints and you're moving lighter weight so if you just think about it in those terms it becomes obvious that of course you want to do the stuff that that moves the whole body and gets the whole system going um which leads into the final point i wanted to comment on about what you said which is you know you, you mentioned you need a foundation of strength in order for bodybuilding to be useful 100 percent. and one thing that i've learned under your guidance, Will, <clears throat> is that if you do, let, let's, if the, the internet term for this is power building, right? Um, so it's not like you just get strong uh, and then and then you stop moving heavy weights with a barbell and then you just do a bunch of body part split stuff. It's like, no, um, you, can't, you can't do much of an LP on a preacher dumbbell bicep curl. Uh, but if you're continually driving up your bench press and you're continually driving up your overhead press, your, your dumbbell preacher curl will also increase. And by the way, guys, the caveat here is I'm talking about people not on drugs. Uh, if you, you add drugs to the mix and everything changes. You can you apply any type of stress and you're going to grow. So I'm just talking about people that are not on a bunch of drugs. Um, so, so yeah, there's a bunch of stuff here that's, that's unintuitive. Um, but let, let's, let's take this moment to discuss my programming, Will, because I think the audience will be curious. So here's, here's basically my situation. I'm an orthopedic nightmare. Um, I've had... I, I can't count the number of surgeries I've had in my head, just off the top of my head. Um, I've got a, a few surgeries pending. It's uh, most, most pressing is my left knee because of a bucket handle meniscus tear. Um, I've got a whole slew of issues to deal with. I still enjoy my physical existence. I still care about being stronger. I still want to lift weights. I'm now retired from jujitsu. I'm now retired from Muay Thai. 
Um, I, I don't think running is a good idea, even though I do kind of enjoy short runs. So there's not that much stuff that I can actually do, which kind of reinforces the point of why this is so important. The strength training stuff is available to anyone at any age. Um, and as I mentioned, I can't program for myself. Why can't I program for myself? Because after my neck surgery, I don't know how to program my overhead press. Um, I had neck issues for years and years and years, and I would tweak it constantly, and I'm just, I'm just afraid. So you, you handle that for me. After all the low back issues I had from sledding accidents and all this other stuff, um, I don't know how to program my squat. And especially considering my elbow issues and all these other things, I've got, I, I, I don't envy your position, Will, because you've got a lot of considerations to, to keep in mind when you're, when you're writing out my program each week. So, so what, you've, what you've landed on, um, and you refer to this as load management, which I would like you to expand upon, what you've landed on is um, having me move heavy weights on a, on a limited basis. Um, not being concerned about, about setting PRs constantly, you know, setting PRs when it makes sense, not doing balls to the walls, uh, you know, balls to the wall grinder limit reps. Um, and then, and then adding in other, um, other exercises that, that might improve my strength in a small range of motion or for smaller muscle groups, or, you know, with, with one or two joints involved. But at least I'm in the gym doing something. And then the cool thing is, even though I don't get my PRs all the time like I used to, I mean, shit, you're probably programming like a six-year-old, um, at least I get some aesthetic benefits and I can notice that, uh, that things are improving. So for example, you know, I've got 18-inch biceps now, which is like, that's kind of cool. Thanks, Will. You know, so that's, that, that's my take on, on what's going on here. Um, what's, your, what's your point of view on my situation and how can, that, how can the audience uh, relate that to what they're trying to do too? Well, I think uh, whenever it comes to your particular situation, you you actually missed out on one of the biggest considerations with your programming is that you also have an autoimmune disease as well. And so your programming is actually probably more tailored to training somebody with Crohn's disease than it is somebody with a multitude of orthopedic issues. So the Crohn's disease actually becomes the biggest piece of that. And then the orthopedic issues are just making modifications as needed to, to the major exercises. But yeah, the Crohn's disease is actually kind of the umbrella um, issue that you have that we, that we have to program against. Let me pause because... it there real quick. That was, that was actually a huge eye opener for me. <laughs> I, just, I just realized the follies in all of my previous attempts to program myself because I literally don't think of myself like an autoimmune um, patient, right? Uh, although if somebody told me they had Crohn's, I would absolutely take that into consideration. So, okay, I feel like an idiot. Please continue. <laughs> yeah, and then um, the other thing, like whenever you said that you can't program for yourself, that's because any of us, I think, that are committed to – committed to this lifestyle, we, 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 we form an emotional attachment to our, to our training. Right. And so we can, whenever we're programming for other people, we're being paid money to be very analytical and to make good decisions for that particular client, because we're almost in like a fiduciary, like responsibility with that patient, that, that client, we want to make the best decisions possible to keep them training, to keep them to keep them improving and stuff like that. And so we don't take unnecessary risks with our clients, but whenever it comes to our own training, we have an emotional attachment. So our programming is based off of emotion, right? So like I can, I can lay out a program for myself for the entire week. I usually do that Sunday morning. I lay out my programming for the week. Um, I have a 0% compliance with my own programming because by the time I get into the gym on Monday morning, I, I realize that I coach myself. I get to the gym. I talk myself into the fact that my coach doesn't know what he's talking about, that I know better than my coach. And so I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. So I get in this like little, this little like circular um, argument with myself that at the time that I'm in the gym, I know better than I knew whenever I was actually analyzing my own program and and leveling stress throughout the week, I get into the gym on Monday and I just decide, you know what, I, I know better than what I did yesterday. And so I know I could do more. Or I've got like, you know, Paul Horn or somebody like needling me on, on Instagram. And so I saw him squat 425. So I'm going to go squat 445. So that's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a universal complaint. That's a universal complaint with us is that we're too, we're too emotionally attached to our, to our own training. Yeah. But so when it comes to your training, so what we had to do is there are certain movements that you don't tolerate the same way that we would have like a, a 
novice come into the gym. We can't linearly linearly progress your your deadlift or your squat because whenever we do that, your recovery ability, primarily because of age and autoimmune disease, doesn't allow you to just continue to to linearly progress, you know, ad nauseum, right? You can't just keep doing that. Your recovery ability is actually variable day to day because I mean you're in a high high stress position. You've got an autoimmune disorder. Um, you don't sleep well because you've got a high position of of stress and all this kind of stuff, right? So all that comes in that comes into play. So your programming is more like what I would call like wave, almost like wave running, that we we get you at a moderate a moderate total workload for the main exercise so take something like deadlift have you pull something like a, a moderate moderately heavy single and you do that to maintain proficiency at lifting closer to max weight then we drop you back down and you do something like let's say four sets of three and that's something that's moderate moderate um, and then we move on to a couple of assistance exercises and those are all spread out throughout the week now, as we go week to week, instead of just adding weight to the bar, because what we know with you is whenever we just keep adding weight to the bar, then we end up running you into a wall very quickly. And then we have to deal. And I think if you if you pay attention to the um, the boards and stuff like that, I think a lot of people fall into the same thing that you see people that they hit the wall, they reset, they hit a wall, they reset, they hit a wall and they reset. So what I've been doing with you and some of my other clients that are that are in a relatively similar position is we increase the volume and then increase weight, drop the volume back down. Mm. So you go from like threes and we ramp you up to fives or sixes, and then we drop you back down to threes whenever we increase the weight. Mm. That way you get multiple exposures, but every single time you come into the gym for that particular workout that week, the intensity is going up because three reps is a little bit easier than four reps per set. And if you do four sets of three, that's 12 reps. If you go immediately up to four sets of four, you go from 12 reps to 16 reps. We've actually just increased your volume by 33%. Hmm. So what I do with you is your, your improvements are going to be like, you know, say four sets of three, the next week, you're going to do four, four, three, three, the next week, four, 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 four. And so you get, kind of get the stair step approach where you're moving the volume up and to a point where we figure that we're getting your intensity about as high as we need it at that volume load. Then we increase the weight and drop your volume back down. That way you have more time to acclimate to that, that particular weight tolerance. And we just move you up week to week. And then whenever you start to get to the point where recovery is starting to become an issue, then we can peel back some of the assistance exercises because we figure that now with your recovery abilities during that week, we've overloaded your ability to recover from that. So we can, we can take one exercise out and have you train that next week. So it's really just kind of, you have all these, all these pieces, all these extra exercises that we're putting into the, into the program, but we're keeping the main lifts throughout every single week. And then we're changing the assistance exercises as needed. And you start to see that whenever, if you do this type of progression with some of the assistance exercises, you'll see, you'll get to the point where you just really can't in, increase the amount of volume or load on that particular lift. At that point, that that lift at that particular time has probably run its course. And so now you take that out and you substitute something else that's similar, but the stress is going to be a little bit different and you run that up. That way we've kept you training steadily without any interruptions or any um, injury kind of timeouts for at this point, I think we're probably going on 15, 16 months or so before you, since you've had an actual time where we had to really peel things back. Yeah, which is probably the longest of my training career. Um, so thank you. you. Gone, you gone from, I think about two, 220 or so, I think was at the thinnest that you were, and now you're back up to about 242. Yeah. But your body fat percentage has actually gone down a little bit from whenever you're 220. Yeah. So you had this over the course of a year and a half or so, you've had this steady increase in body weight, but your body fat percentage has gone down as as you've increased that, which I think kind of flies in the face of what a lot of people on the internet think whenever they think of starting strength. Mm -hmm. They think a lot of people that are just kind of built like meatballs, right? That they just <laughs> they go from 100, 120 pounds to 270 pounds, and then they look like a meatball. And it's, it's like, eh, that's not really what happens. 
um, a lot of that is food choices, right? Sure. Like there's certainly people that got fat doing starting strength. There's a lot of people that got fat running marathons too, uh -huh. because it all depends on how you eat. And doing yoga. If you're eating calories a day, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you're going to gain body fat, you yeah. know? Yeah. But to the point where you said, um, you know, the, the barbell exercises, what I would say with that is you're absolutely right in that you're creating the frame that people want, right? So whenever you're talking about male trainees, the vast majority of male trainees are actually looking for what's called the X frame, right? So wide shoulders, narrow waist, and then big, big at the quads. So it's kind of shaped like an X, right? There's no, there's no set of accessory exercises that you can do that's actually going to build that. And if it, you could piece together an accessory program to build that type of a physique, it's going to take you 25 years to do that. And I think the vast majority of trainees will, will learn that one day. Mm -hmm. But whenever you're talking about training programs, I think a lot of people, not only do they get emotionally attached to their program, but it's almost becomes like a faith-based argument with people mm -hmm. that no amount of objective evidence or data can sway somebody from the program that they like to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody, whenever they were 16 years old, they picked up, you know, a flex magazine that had Jay Cutler's 10 weeks to the Olympia. And because that's what Jay Cutler said he did at that point, they've been doing that for 30 years. And it's hard to convince people that number one, you're not Jay Cutler. Number two is that's probably not the program he was doing. That's something that he threw into the the interview and it was probably just the the person who wrote the article that put that program together you know and if you look at some of the bigger names in bodybuilding which i'm not a bodybuilder i hate the fact that you even thought that i was because <laughs> honestly like don't don't give a damn what i look like i just kind of stumbled across like not looking too bad but some of that was because I can't eat like a jerk because up until a couple of weeks ago, I was active duty army. And so I had to keep myself within a certain weight range, you know, mm -hmm. but um, if you look at most of the big, the big name bodybuilders now, guys like Chris Bumstead, Chris Bumstead is a 700 plus pound deadlifter. I mean, he posts videos of him doing, you know, 585 for a set of six or eight or something like that. Like the guy is an incredibly strong dude. And he didn't get to where he didn't get to building a 585 deadlift and a four time classic physique, Mr. Olympia by doing a bunch of leg extensions mm -hmm. or preach. Curls. Like he got that by being a big, strong dude to begin with. And, and the then he did leg extensions and preacher curls. Yes. And he yeah. does that as he's getting ready for competition, yeah. as he's getting ready for competition. And you look, look at, you look at since the beginning of time, since bodybuilding started, everybody kind of gets big in the off season. And then as they get closer to competition, they start trimming down. Mm -hmm. And as they trim down, now they're in a caloric deficit, they're dehydrated and stuff like that. That's whenever the assistance exercises come in because they can get more work out of the assist, the assistance exercises because in a calorie deficit, carb depleted, dehydrated, they're not in there squatting 585 for sets of 10, right? right? They're doing leg extensions and preacher curls because that's basically all the tolerance that they have. Mm. But that's what they're doing to bring out like the striations in the muscle as they're carb depleted and dehydrated, right? Yeah. Now, if you watch those guys train, they train big muscle movements. They train with a, a relatively high degree of intensity and the, the, the cake decorations that you're talking about are the very fine chisels make up a very small part of their program, but we become hyper-focused on the assistance stuff because, well, let's just face it. It's a little bit more enjoyable training whenever you don't feel like you're dying on every single rep. And so it almost becomes like confirmation bias because I feel decent whenever I do this exercise, it's better than whenever I'm under a 495 pound squat because that hurts. So obviously this must be better for me and people don't keep objective data on their physique over a long period of time to see that their program that they're doing is actually not effective. Mm. Yeah, you know, the the reason why people focus on the small body parts and the small muscle groups over the stuff that's most effective, I think is probably the same reason why trainees are so interested in buying supplements and whey protein and BCAAs and creatine when they haven't addressed their diet yet. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, the, the small, easy, uh, technical, um, quick fix stuff is appealing and attractive, but it's not, it is not the thing that will get you to where you want to go. 
Um, it's it's very hard. It's a very hard truth to put into clients and patients alike that the number one thing that they can do to build the physique, the performance level, whatever that they want, the number one thing you can do is be consistent over a long period of time. Yep. You can be consistent. If you do the wrong program for a long period of time and you're consistent, you will see changes. Mm -hmm. Now, if you add hard work and consistency over a long period of time, now the value, the, the value of that particular program becomes exponentially higher, right? And then, but everybody wants that. I, I hate this. There's a couple of like social media influencers out there that I absolutely despise because they over they overemphasize this idea of optimal training. That if you do a lat pull down, it's got to be in this particular plane of movement, and you've got to have this amount of internal rotation or external rotation of your shoulders. And they one pardon my language, but they look like shit. They don't train very hard, but somehow they get this big following and they're pushing this narrative because that's what sets them apart from every other person in the, the fitness sphere. But now that became, whereas like 10 years ago, it was all about mobility. Everybody wanted to be flexible and mobile and Kelly Starrett and all those people were coming out with these books, like becoming a supple leopard or whatever. Now that's kind of given a given way because people have seen that that's, that's a load of shit. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything. And you still have a couple of like diehard practitioners, but most people have moved away from that. Now the idea is, well, I just need to train optimally. I need to, you know, do a concentration curl with this number of degrees of pronation in my forearm or whatever, because it's harder to get people to buy into the program whenever you tell them that it's got to be hard. How's it your rip impression? I have a horrible rip impression. Let me, let me give like, it a shot. <clears throat> complexity appeals to stupid people. I think that's the summary here, right? I mean, Nick and I were talking about this the other day on the podcast in the fitness myths one, and, and Bree can link to that for those who want to check it out. Uh, but you've got, you know, these guys on the internet uh, talking about, you know, do X amount of minutes in zone two and Y amount of minutes in zone three and blah, 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 blah. They specify all these things uh, because it sounds good. And, and, you know, it, it's, it's nice to know what you're doing, but these guys get to such a degree of detail where, you know, they're just kind of making shit up. Um, and, and they're, well, they're I mean, emphasizing I'm, things that can't be that important because they're kind of missing the big picture. I get a double dose of that because I work in a particular profession in healthcare where like the motto for physical therapy is complicate to validate, right? Cause mm. it can't be, it can't be so simple that somebody comes in with knee pain or shoulder pain because there's a lot of life decisions that they're making that is leading them to having this particular problem, right? Somebody comes in with back pain. Back pain is very highly correlated with things like depression, smoking, and things like that. It's very easy for somebody to come in with back pain to do an assessment and say, look, there's nothing wrong with your spine per se. You have persistent low back pain. Here are the things that we can address. And primarily that's going to be getting people active right? It's a whole lot, whole lot more marketable if you're a healthcare professional for you to give somebody a very involved technical diagnosis that you have tight hip flexors and your quadratus lumborum is, is not functioning properly and your core abdominal muscles are firing in the wrong pattern. Because whenever you do that, now you've created a need for your services. They <laughs> yep. you're the person that they have to go to. And that's why people say, well, your, your hips are out of alignment or your SI joint needs to be manipulated because now I've created dependency for that patient on me. So whenever their back hurts or their hips hurt, it's not that they're, they're not managing their load appropriately. Now they've got to come to me because I've got the, the magically calibrated fingers to be able to assess that their SI joint is out of place and I'm going to pop, pop it back into place. Whenever that's not supported by the literature whatsoever, what's supported by the literature is whenever you do that, that you create some changes in the central nervous system that is probably just inhibition of descending uh, sensory input, that we probably just create a, a situation in the brain where it becomes less sensitive to pain input in that that's a temporary a temporary improvement right but if i can get you coming into my clinic three times a week for the next 12 weeks or whatever that's now 
36 appointments that I don't have to fill with somebody else. But, um, damn, that was a tangent. I'm sorry. No, I, no, that's a, that's God. the chiropractic business model, essentially. Um, yeah, I mean, the massage therapist and, and, to an extent, you know, and physical therapists. I, I mean, I hate to say it, but we're, our profession is supposed to breed independence in a patient. Hmm. We're supposed to teach people. Our primary job really should be education. Our primary job should be education to teach people how to be able to take care of themselves whenever these low thing, low low acuity type injuries type uh, happen. But what we've ended up doing, even though a lot of physical therapists, not not myself in particular, have a very poor um, assessment of chiropractors, which chiropractors tip, typically have a poor assessment of physical therapists. And they're is, both right. <laughs> like we should we should have a mutual respect for each other because we work in the same sphere. We just kind of overlap in certain places. But, um, but most, physical... most people in both fields, uh, from my experience are, are not that useful. So that might be why there's so much finger pointing going on. I would say that because I think that, uh, like I said, you know, if you run a healthcare profession or a healthcare clinic where your primary business model is to try to breed independence in your patients, then you're having to get new patient referrals all the time. It's actually a very horrible business model, yep. but the business model that we have is not, not really all that conducive to having a successful practice. So we actually have to kind of go against our ethics to run a successful physical therapy clinic. Now, luckily I had the, I had the luxury of being able to practice physical therapy in the government system. And I know that, that, that sounds like, heresy on here, but I had a never, I had a never ending supply of patients. No matter what I did, I would always have a line out the door. And so we were, we had the luxury of treating patients as they were needed to be treated, not treating as we need to keep the doors open. You know, so even though we kept some like kind of quasi made up metrics on our productivity and stuff like that we had all the leeway in the world to treat patients as we as we saw fit to get them back to duty because at the end of the day in the military healthcare system our system is there in place to keep people ready to deploy to go overseas and engage the enemies of the united states right so that was our primary mission we could treat people evidence-based we could treat them however we saw fit that you could not theoretically i think theoretically you would have um a very hard time keeping a physical therapy clinic open treating that same way in the civilian world which then breeds someone like you comes into their clinic and a physical therapist clinic for you is probably pretty useless yeah they're not going to know how to treat you right that's for sure i've experienced that firsthand um well uh I, I think this might be the the main question of the podcast here so let me let me know what you think about this um all right my take on what to do if you're a guy who has gone through the diligent process of getting your deadlift to around 500, getting your squat to around 400, getting your bench to around 300, getting your press to around 200. You've, uh, you know, you, you are interested in aesthetics, but you're smart enough to know that that is actually the thing. Go, pursuing those numbers is actually the best bang for your buck when it comes to looking better. And so you were diligent and disciplined and you only did that for whatever, depends on the guy. Maybe it takes 24 months to get there. Um, and then you're thinking to yourself, you know what? I want to look better. I'd like to look better. My take on that is, uh, first of all, make sure your body composition is dialed in. Um, eat what I eat. This is a Stan Efferty Monster Mash. I eat this three, four times a day. It's my favorite food. It's cheap. It's quick. Um, it's healthy. My blood panel's in good shape. So get your body composition in order. And then if you want to, fr from that point, if you're like, all right, I'm, I'm muscular, I'm big, um, I'm, my body composition is where I want it to be, I'm not too lean, not too fat. Uh, and then the guy's like, you know, but I wouldn't mind having some more shape, right? I, wanna, I do want to put some icing. when you're already strong. So can you be specific about what you would suggest to someone like that in terms of exercise selection, 
reps and sets. And again, guys, I just want to really reinforce this caveat. Do not do this unless you're already strong because you're wasting your time. But if you're already strong and you've decided that you want to keep getting stronger, but you also want to start chiseling the the shape a bit more, then this is where this stuff comes in. So Will, what's what's your take? Yeah. So whenever you start adding additional exercises to the program, you got to be, you got to be careful to do two things. Number one is I don't personally believe that the old bodybuilding split where you do all of your chest stuff on one day, and then you wait until Monday to do chest again. I don't think that that's the, the most efficient way to do it. I'm one of those that I, I ascribe to the belief that the more repetition or the more frequency that you can get, the better off you're going to be. Right. And so if you train, train a muscle group on Monday and then you wait seven days to train it again, at that point, you're going to go through some detraining. And I think that that's probably another big thing that individuals do that that screws their progress up is that by the time they train again, they've already set the detraining has already set in. So they just kind of keep spinning their wheels because they're taking too long of a rest interval. So if you cut if you cut your amount of total volume for a muscle group down and you're not doing, you know, eight exercises, four sets of eight to 12, and you're doing it once a week, you can trim that down to maybe two exercises. And you can do that more frequently throughout the week. So the first thing that I start to have people do is I have people start adding accessory benches, accessory bench movements, a lot of rowing. So I have people row two, three, four times a week, depending on their tolerance. People with low back injuries tend to tend to be the two to three times a week. I've I handle a lot of volume in my back pretty well. So I do pulling movements about four times a week and other people that I have that have pretty, pretty solid backs. Like they, they can row up to about four times a week, but they're doing variations of the rows, right? Sometimes it's maybe a seated cable row. Sometimes it's a Yates row. Sometimes it's a, a strict pin lay row or whatever, but you, you spread those out throughout the week, but you start like um, you almost think of it as like a one lift a day, one lift a day type program. So you're training four days a week. You've got, you've got your bench day, you've got or your main bench day. You've got your main squat day, your main press day and your main um, deadlift day. That second exercise that you pick in that day, day has to be a complementary movement to another day out of the week because you don't necessarily always want to bench and then incline bench because now you're stacking your two main chest movements on one day and so anything that you do the rest of the week is going to be a smaller movement you want to level that throughout the week so it might be something like uh bench press and then um the let's say the next day the next training day you're going to do deadlifts you might do something like uh like a leg press or something like that. So you're doing like an accessory squat movement and then you go into your, your accessories. And what you have to do is you have to level your, your accessory work throughout the week, but you add in accessory bench days. So bench, Larson bench, close grip bench press, something like that so that you're pressing multiple times throughout the week. Incline bench press is another good one. Uh, whenever you're focusing on hypertrophy, if you're, or if you're a thrower, if you're a shot putter or you're an athlete, incline bench, relatively relatively effective for that. Outside of that, if you have no problems pressing, then incline bench, probably not all that effective. If you have problems pressing and it's hard for you to press once or twice a week, then incline bench becomes uh, a go-between between the bench press and the overhead press. So if you can if you can incline bench and it's more tolerable than overhead press, then incline benching a two to one ratio for overhead press will keep your overhead press relatively high and you won't detrain on the overhead press and less frequency on the overhead press tends to suit people pretty well. Um, then the accessory lifts that you get th that you start to add into your program, they have to be relatively large movements. Something like a knee extension or a leg curl is a very small movement because you're fixing fixing a two joint muscle and you're moving one joint and it's a very small movement, right? A Romanian deadlift is a much bigger movement because it incorporates most of the body to do that. So if I want to add in a hamstring accessory lift, the first one I'm going to do is a Romanian deadlift. I can handle more weight. I can, I can handle more weight. I can handle more stress. The rest of my body is getting stress on that particular movement but I move from big compound movements whenever I add them into my program. And over time, whenever I get to the point where it's hard to just keep progressing on my Romanian deadlift, I'm going to add something else in there or take the place of Romanian deadlifts 
and it's going to give way to something that's a little bit more, little bit more focused. And that's what you're going to do with all of your movements over time. A dumbbell, a dumbbell seated overhead press, right? That's a relatively big movement, but it's something that's slightly different than your overhead press. You can work a slightly different angle. And for most people, they can dumbbell overhead press more comfortably than they can an overhead press if they have persistent shoulder problems, mm -hmm. especially range of motion, range of motion deficits. So you have them add that in and you take the same kind of rep approach that I, that I talked about that you're going to start with something that's moderately heavy. And if you just take that, if you just take that particular programming methodology to where you, you as you start to add in accessory movements, they're, they're intelligent selections so that you're adding big movements and it's giving way to smaller movements over time. And then as you, as you bring in a smaller movement, that's only there temporarily. You don't do leg curls from now until the day that you, that you die. You do leg curls as a little, little bit of a break from the larger movement. Mm. So that's like what we're doing with you, right? Mm. So we found with you that uh, a lot of barbell rows or Yates rows were starting to, starting to bother your back and your, and your um, elbow. But they were starting to get to the point where the the investment in the fatigue, the accumulating fatigue in your back was starting to get too high. So what, what did we do? We substituted that for a seal row. So now you're doing a prone row that it kind of completely eliminates the low back from the from the equation. And now you're still getting a row movement, but it's not something that's as um not something that's as isolated as say something like a seated one arm cable row. Your stress throughout the week was starting to get too much for the low back. So we've got to take something out, but we don't want to get rid of deadlifts. So we take out the big, the biggest rowing movement, put something else in there that gets us as close to that particular movement as possible that allows you to handle as much weight as possible. And then over time, we're going to have to probably work you back down into something like a seated cable row. And then as you've had a break from the heavy rows, then we're going to come back to the heavy rows again. So it's kind of this, this, um, this like wave program where you add in big movements, they give way to, to lower movements. And those are going to be your periods of time where you're either that's the time that you're going to take, like your cut, you want to reduce your body weight, body fat a little bit. You're going to do that whenever you have more of the accessory type movements, the isolated movements in there. And then as you kind of trim down a little bit, then we start adding in the bigger movements again, add in more calories to your program so that you can get a little bit bigger and then we trim it back down. So it's kind of this never ending cycle of you're kind of getting a little bit bigger to the point where you get to the point where your body fat percentage is as high as you want it to get. Then we start to cut down a little bit, but we're not doing what bodybuilders do. We're not bringing you up to 300 pounds of body weight and then trying to cut you down to 230 for competition, right? We're talking swings of maybe five, five pounds, mm -hmm. eight pounds, maybe at the most, mm -hmm. gain about eight pounds. And we know that if you're eating right, that that's probably going to be about five pounds of muscle mass and about three pounds of fat. That three pounds of fat is actually quite a bit. So you're going to trim down. You're going to lose maybe a pound or two of muscle mass, but you're going to lose three pounds of fat. Mm -hmm. And that's going to change your body, uh, body fat percentage. Right. Um, and then the next thing that you have to keep in mind, and this is the thing that is probably the most salient point of all of this is that even whenever you're doing physique specific training, it has to be heavy. It has to be heavy. You can't, there's nothing magic about four sets of eight to 12. That's going to build muscle. That volume is there for a particular reason. And I think most people don't understand the principle behind that. The best way that I could I could sum it up, and it's something that you've been doing you've been doing for a long time. Dr. Mueller here in Texas is doing the same thing, and is having exactly the same the same benefits that you're having. The think of whenever you're doing four sets of like eight to twelve, those first two sets are almost like a pre-fatiguing set. That you do those first two sets just to build up some fatigue in the muscle. Those next two sets, they have to be heavy enough that at the end of each set that you are working to failure or just about failure on both of those sets. Because whenever it comes to building muscle or hypertrophy specific adaptation, it's a combination of the structural load on the muscle and the overall workload of the muscle. Now, in order for you to engage as much of the muscle as possible, you have to get to the point where the body has no more motor units to recruit. 
Now, if we go back to, um, I believe it was Schoenfeld from McMaster's University that came out with the big study that was in the New York Times that said you can lift lightweight and get just as much hypertrophy as people lift <laughs> heavy. And, and you know, if you look at the, if you look at just the raw data, that was absolutely the case. The data did support that, but there, you have to read into the was, methods a little bit. Was little it a bit. retrospective study? No, it was a it was a prospective study. It was a cohort study, and they the that particular tagline was absolutely correct. But the way that they lifted lightweight is this barbaric method of training that the vast majority of people are never going to try to do. So they were doing they were doing lightweight high repetition sets. They were doing 20, 22, 25 reps to failure. And then they had a spotter there with them and they were, they were doing a quick rest pause. And then they were doing another set to failure. And then whenever they'd hit failure a couple of times, then they were doing forced repetition. So now the spotter grabs the bar and forces you to be able to complete a couple of more repetitions. That, that sounds a like a recipe for tendonitis, man. Yes, that is a that is a recipe for rhabdo. That's a recipe for tendonitis. That's a recipe for people being non-compliant with their with their programming. That's horrible. I've been training for a long time, and I train at a relatively high intensity comp compared to most people I know. I I wouldn't train that hard. One because no. it's it's, dumb. but it led them to be able to say you can lift lightweight and you can get the same hypertrophy benefit as someone who lifts heavier. But what comes out of that and what's supported by the literature is the idea of the number of effective reps that you do. So if I, me being a, a relatively strong dude, if I go into the gym and I bench 135 for four sets of 12, there's nothing about that that's going to create any type of positive adaptive stimulus for me. I'm, I bench in the high 300s four sets of 12 is not going to do anything for me at 135 pounds. Four sets of 12 at 295 is going to be the, to the point where I get to the fourth set of 12 at 295, I'm going to be at failure on every single rep, right? So the best way that I could try to boil down effective reps is an effective rep is one that's actually challenging at that point in time. So whenever you, whenever you do a couple of sets and those first two sets are just to kind of get, build up some fatigue in the muscle and you have enough load. Now, if here, let me, let me step back just a little bit. The reason why the novice linear progression is so effective for people is the idea of effective reps is already built in. It's baked into the program. to squat three sets of five anymore right you do maybe the first two reps and then reps three four and five are are pretty challenging the bar starts to slow down and they're they take a little bit more mental fortitude to get through that you come back for the second set and the first rep or two are a little bit easier because you had this rest interval then three four and five are are hard then you come back that that third set that first rep is moderate and then set uh, reps two three four and five are difficult right and as people get to that end part of the novice linear progression now you're at the point point where if, uh, for all intents and purposes three sets of five on squat you're getting 15 effective reps right and so those are 15 reps that are challenging and the reason why we say challenging is because whenever you're getting to the point where you're you're almost struggling to complete that rep you're recruiting as much of a maximum number of motor units into that 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 particular movement as possible the more muscle you use in the movement or, or that exercise the more efficient it's going to be for creating the the hypertrophy stimulus so people get very big on starting strength because the the idea of effective reps is already built in built into the program. Now, what happens with a lot of people and why they they continue to get stronger but they don't have this continued hypertrophy benefit is because what happens with people as they start to get towards the end of that novice linear progression, people start taking heavy singles and they drop from fives to threes. Mm. 
and they drop from threes to twos and stuff like that because they keep trying to pile weight onto the bar, but now they can't do it for five reps. Now they're doing, you know, three doubles or something like that. You've gone from 15 challenging reps. I can do that one time and then I got to back off a little bit to get a little bit more volume. But if you're training for hypertrophy, you're looking for the maximum number of effective reps. So you peel a little bit of weight back so that whenever you get to the point where it's challenging, you have that strength base and the efficiency to recruit motor uh, units that you can overcome it being challenging and you take that up to near failure. At those last two sets, you're trying every single rep you want to be as close to fit. You want to get as close to failure as you can with every rep being as challenging as possible. So it becomes a little bit of a dance. If you load the weight a little bit too much, you lower the number of total reps that you can get. If you lower the weight too much, then you increase the number of repetitions that you can do. And the proportion of effective reps becomes much smaller, mm -hmm. right? Because now you're just, you hear uh, guys like, um, is it Mike Israel? Israel or something yeah. like that. Yeah. But he, he talks about he talks about junk volume and junk volume is absolutely a thing, right? Like I said, four sets of twelve for me at one thirty five on my bench is junk volume. Yeah. It's not creating it's not cr creating a positive adaptation stress for me. But if I do let's say two seventy five and I'm doing five sets of eight with that most of those reps are going to be something that I actually have to push hard to get through those because at some point 275 is just heavy for, for anything. Right. But if you, if you do that, so 100% as close to 100% of your, of your total reps being hard, challenging reps, that is training for strength. Mm -hmm. Training for hypertrophy is training the same way, but you have to lower the weight to where now you're looking at maybe 50 to 60% of your repetitions where you would, you'd rack the bar, you give yourself a 10, 15 second rest, and then you'd bang out another two or three reps. And you'll be the first to admit, I'm sure, that even though you took a short rest, those two or three reps that you did at the end of that were very, very difficult, but you had just enough recovery to be able to do that. That's adding the number of total effective reps that you're able to get. And then the last thing that you have to add into that whenever you're training for hypertrophy specifically is you have to maintain the quality of the muscle contraction. And so that's taking movements through an entire effective range of motion, getting to the top of the movement, doing things like um, peak contraction, which is really just increasing time under tension but you want to work through the full range of motion because as you take that set to failure, if you're working through a full range of motion, you're trying to level that mechanical stress on the muscle throughout as much of the muscle as you can. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're working through smaller ranges of motion, I don't think that you're able to effectively engage motor units throughout the entire muscle. Yep. So what you're looking for is you're looking for a heavy enough weight heavy enough weight and a big enough movement to create enough structural strain for a positive adaptation that you're, you're trying to challenge yourself to get the maximum number of effective reps by moderating the, the load enough to where you can increase the, the number of challenging reps that you can do without lowering it so much that it just becomes junk volume. If you're, if you're not working close to failure for hypertrophy, then you're not doing anything, but maybe a, maybe a recovery week that you just want to expend some calories. But I don't think that being that an individual that is not
things would deteriorate and and maybe I would maybe I would stay static but I, I feel like things would decline in terms of my overall strength and ability to move weight in those other ranges of motion um, are those two caveats accurate yeah I think so because I mean if you think about it like what's what someone uh, even if even if it's relatively heavy for them at that time because you have to you have to balance all of those all of those things what I think a lot of people might or maybe I just envisioned some people taking what I said the wrong way and saying, well, if I go in there and I pick up a heavy enough dumbbell and I do four sets of 12 and the dumbbell's relatively heavy for all 48 reps, then I'm going to get big biceps. That's a part of it. But that 15 pound dumbbell for a six foot two, 135 pound male is probably not enough structural strain on the muscle tissue itself to build a large hypertrophy benefit, right? No, and Will, so I can confirm that for sure. Because when I was a teenager, this is what I did at 24 Hour Fitness, and it did nothing. And I'm doing this stuff now as a strong guy under your guidance, and it's doing something. So th being strong is the difference. And the, the, compound, the compound movements that you're doing allows those other exercises to be more effective that they become complementary lifts to the big movements. The big movements are what's keeping you in that, that kind of like highly sought after like X frame type type build. Right. And I mean, you walk in, walk into any, any gym anywhere. And obviously you're going to have the, the people that are kind of tall and lithe and skinny. And some people, some people like that physique, but the vast majority of the physiques that, that people, um, respect or, or idolize or want to want to look like that, they're all X frame shaped. So at some point, everybody has to build wide shoulders, a narrow waist with a taper in their in their back, and then big, big quads and hips so that they look like an X. Mm. You see very, very few people that are built differently than that, that people aspire to look like. Mm. And you, know, you see that in the strength world all the time that people don't necessarily want to look like a world champion bench presser. Hmm. Nobody, nobody really wants to. Nobody really wants to look like that. And I also don't want to look like a world champion bodybuilder. I think both are are uh, are too extreme and not desirable. You know. Yeah, ex exactly. And I mean, you know, if you look at, but if you look at um, bodybuilders throughout throughout history, right? I mean, uh, I think Arnold Schwarzenegger was a seven hundred pound deadlifter. Damn. I know Franco Colombo was an over seven hundred pound deadlifter. Um, uh, Michael Hearn, everybody, everybody talks shit about Michael Hearn, but I mean, honestly, I think he's a pretty reasonable dude. And I think he, he brings a lot, he brings a lot to the table as far as knowledge and stuff like that. Um, and I think that everybody just, you know, claiming that, well, he's on steroids, like it doesn't really matter because what he brings to the table, as far as knowledge, I, the guy's been in the, been in the industry for like 30 years and he's an approachable guy and stuff like that. But the dude started out as a power lifter and whenever people come to him for training that's the first thing that he says to him is hey you you want you want a nice body but what are you going to do with it so he has people squat he has people deadlift and i think um i i haven't i haven't ver validated the claim but i think at one point he was like an 800 pound deadlifter and i mean I, I think he's probably closing in on 50 if he's not just over 50 now but i, I think it was um up till maybe a couple of years ago, he was squatting like 315 for whatever his age was that year. So he'd take 315 Damn. out and do it for like a set of 46 or whatever. I don't recommend and that, my friends. No, I, do, I don't recommend that at all. <laughs> but, but it's impressive. But he does, if people like that, they do have that same um, that same foundation where they're they're trying to get people to understand that it's the foundation of strength, the compound movements that builds the frame that you want. The accessory movements are what tapers that frame into it being the aesthetic look that you want. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't you don't build big shoulders with front raises and lateral raises and I's, T's, and Y's. You build big build you build big shoulders with bench press and deadlifts and squat and overhead press yep. and heavy dumbbell work and stuff like that you know and that's where most people are going to go wrong they're going to pick crappy exercises they're not going to have a foundation of strengths so no matter how hard they train they're not really going to create the structural strain necessary to create a, a hypertrophy adaptation 
but they're going, they're going to like that type of training and they're going to stay with it because that just becomes, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you see them two years later, the army is a, the army is a really good microcosm of that because people PCS to a location and they're there for about two years and then they, then they leave and you see people their first day in the gym and their last day in the gym and they look exactly the same. It happens all the time. And uh, I've been and there people, before people and that, this the gym all the time. And they'll ask me, Hey, you know, what do you do to look like that? And I tell them, and the next time I see them in the gym, they're doing exactly doing the same, the same thing that they yeah, were yeah, doing yeah. last time because I did not, <laughs> I did not affirm their position that, you know, concentration curls on the cable was the way to big biceps. My biceps got remarkably bigger from the time I went from a 275 bench to a 355 bench. What do you know? My arms got noticeably bigger with no arm work whatsoever. What do you I know? started doing more focused arm work after I had shoulder surgery. And once I had a biceps tendon surgery, then I started doing more bicep work, but I did it as a function of rehab, not as bodybuilding, but me doing rehab, like picking up a 60 pound dumbbell and doing alternating curls, somehow all of a sudden, like I just got a whole lot bigger and a whole lot more muscular. And it's all because of what we've been talking about, yeah. right? Because yeah. the bench and the overhead press and the deadlift being where they were allowed me to move more weight. So whenever I had picked up a dumbbell, I was able to do much more than most anybody in the gym. <clears throat> and that led to an almost immediate reaction of hypertrophy. And I mean, I'm still, I'm still a relatively small guy, but, um, but I don't eat like a, I don't eat like an asshole. I yeah. eat clean most of the time. I keep my body fat at a respectable level. <clears throat> I don't go through periods of bulking and cutting. I just try to stay relatively fit and athletic throughout the, throughout the year. And whenever I do more focused hypertrophy work, like I respond very, very quickly to it. I don't want to embarrass you, man, but can we include a clip of you with your shirt off after you hit that heavy bench single a couple of months back? Cause you look like a freak. You, you look like you're stage ready. And I, I just want, I want to prove the point for people. And really the bigger picture here is, you know, we've, we've experimented with all this shit. So you don't have to, we've made all the mistakes over years and decades, you know, starting with rip and everybody else involved. And we're just, we're running experiments on ourselves because the literature is bullshit. The internet's bullshit. Um, so if you are a curious person who's actually interested in what, what really works, what is the most effective way to get things done? This is what we're trying to pursue. We don't care about who says what, or we don't care about any claims or assertions. We care about what's effective. And we're willing to go through the process of, of finding that out for ourselves with experimentation through our own training and with, and with members um, and clients. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, you think about that. No, no need to respond now. And then, uh, Will, I, I had a feeling that we wouldn't actually get to the, the news about your move and all the stuff with you working with us because we'd get caught up with this, which is perfectly fine. We can always do another episode. I like any excuse I, I can have to, to bring you back on the show. Um, but let me just mention this briefly and then let's, and then let's wrap. Um, so yeah, Will Morris is our official rehab specialist for starting strength gyms. Um, if you train at a starting strength gym, and you're having some sort of an issue and you want Will's expert advice, talk to your coach, your coach will engage Will and he can help. Um, if you are not training at a starting strength gym and you wanna access Will's services, you can go directly to Will via his Instagram um, or you can go to the starting strength gym's website where we will have a listing up for him by the time this episode goes live. Um, and Will is a hell of a guy and is thoughtful about this stuff and Will, I just want to wrap by saying thank you, man, um, because I go to bed now and I'm not in pain and I go to the gym and I have a productive session and I haven't had to take a layoff because of an injury, at least not one cause in the weight room in a long time. And uh, I don't dread or, or hate my training anymore. And I did for a while. Um, and on top of all that, I'm getting, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I haven't set PRs yet, but, and I thought PRs were behind me, but we're getting close to a bench PR and a deadlift PR. And I've never been happier with the way that I look and I'm almost 40. So in, Will, in this particular you. case, like this is the way that we're training you, you're going to hit accidental PRs. We're not, we're not peaking. We're not, we're not doing a 12 week peaking program. We're trying specifically to get you to a new PR. It's actually just a part of the normal training. So you're going to walk into the gym here in a month, month and a half or so, and you're going to, you're going to be scheduled for a deadlift single. That's going to match or 
break your all time PR, but it's not going to be something that you're overreaching to get that. Yep. You're going to get that as a part of your normal training because everything is still moving linearly. And one thing that I would say is that whenever it comes to the, the starting strength model and stuff like that, and like maybe how I look now compared to whenever I started or whatever, there's probably not been many more faithful practitioners of the starting strength method than me over the last 12, 13 years at 13 years, 13 years, because the first time I, I first dabbled in it was uh, 2010. And I mean, I did that primarily with no other real realistic uh, training methodology up until um, whenever I was in Washington. So a couple of years ago, but I, I probably did a solid, I probably did a solid nine years of training under nothing but starting strength methodology. And then I just got to the point where age and stuff like that, I had to kind of change a little bit up, but I didn't get to where I am now by doing what I'm doing now. I got to where I am now by doing starting strength yeah. and the, the programming methodology for many, many years and got to, I mean, I would say, I would say pretty decent levels of strength. And when I was in Washington, I mean, I was, I was deadlifting 550. I was squatting 550 and I benched 405 with about a 220, 225 strict press. And so like I got to reasonable numbers for a guy that weighs 170 pounds. Like those aren't, those aren't terrible. I'm definitely not, I'm definitely not John Hack. I mean, John Hack is my same or essentially my same body weight or, or weight class. And I mean, he's benching 600 pounds, but I'm not John Hack. Yep. I'm Will Morris. I'm a normal, yeah. I'm a normal human. A mere mortal. Yeah. yeah. But I did that by training primarily through that. And so, there, I mean, there were many, many years of lifting very, very heavy and trying to get my strength up to a, a decent level. And then whenever I kind of made the switch and started doing some of more of this stuff, almost as a rehab, um, as a, as a way to rehab myself from surgery. Like I noticed that the, the physique changes came along very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. I've had the exact same experience. And the thing I feel guilty about Will is when I'm in the gym doing, you know, accessory lightweight, uh, single joint bullshit. And there's young kids next to me that are skinny and doing the same thing. I fear that they're looking over at me and like, Oh, if I keep doing this, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll be 250 one day, you know? Um, and I just, you know, it's, I, I, I do feel bad about that, but, um, will we should, we should wrap here, man, plug your Instagram if you can. And then, um, let's schedule another one. Should I have to think about this? I think it's at Morris DPT SSC. Nice. Hell yeah. Well, man, every time you come on, I learn something. Um, and I know the audience did too, or at least most of them. There's a few that can't learn, um, but we'll, we'll ignore them for now. Um, but man, thanks for your time as always. Congratulations yeah. on, uh, on yeah, retiring. Congratulations on the move. Uh, we couldn't be more fired up to have you as part of the group and uh, looking forward to the next one. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, man. Hell yeah. Thanks, Will. All right, brother. We'll talk to you later. All right. All right. See you.